Uh, welcome to, to this public lecture by Professor Massimo Riva titled Simulating the Past from Analog to Digital and Vice Versa. And first of all, uh, let me thank Professor Riva for accepting our invitation. We are very grateful to have him as the second keynote speaker for our interdisciplinary Italy summer school. And this is in fact the closing event uh, of our three day long summer school dedicated to the digital turn when, why, and how to embrace it, which I had the pleasure to organize together with Professor Claude Brook, and which has been hosted by Trinity College Dublin and with the support of Royal Holloway and UCL. And there could not be a better way, I believe, to end our summer school dedicated to digital culture in Italian studies than by hosting a keynote by Professor Riva. Over the years, Professor Riva has been actively involved in many of the events organized within the Interdisciplinary Italy project and became an important voice for the scholarly discussion that this project has generated. And more importantly, Massimo Riva, who is professor of Italian studies at Brown University, is one of the first and more influential scholars within Italian studies to have critically engaged with digital culture, as well as with digital tools and digital methodologies. And indeed what makes uh, his work particularly fascinated is the fact that in Professor Riva's research, his scholarly reflection over the cultural change that the digital revolution has brought upon us is combined with his mastery of the new technologies and tools that digital technologies offer us. And it does not simply look and at and reflect on cultural changes, but he also embraces these changes in his research in a case of developing theory through practice. And Professor Riva has published on a wide range of topics, including several author and edited books on literary maladies and national identity in the 18th and 19th centuries, posthumism and the hypernovel contemporary fiction and the future of literature in the digital age. And since the late 1990s, his pioneering work in the digital humanities has led to the creation of several projects, including the, the Cameron Web, the Virtual Humanities Lab, Pico della Mirandola Project, and Garibaldi Panorama and the Risorgimento Archive. And he's the recipient of several honors, including a Digital Innovation Fellowship from the American Council of Learned Societies. He has recently completed a digital monograph titled Italian Shadows, A Curious History of Virtual Reality, soon to be published by Stanford University Press. And I believe that this last publication will be at least part of the today keynote. So without further ado, I would like to leave the floor now to Professor Riva and thank him again for being here to us, with us today. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Eleonora, and uh, thank you, Clodagh and Manuela and Florian and Juliana. It's a real pleasure to be part of uh, uh, such an exciting and stimulating uh, summer school, uh, which is a perfect expression of uh, one of the most innovative uh, uh, projects, uh, the Interdisciplinary Italy project uh, of recent years in our field. So I, I look forward to many more years of involvement, uh, whatever the evolution of Interdisciplinary Italy is. So um, you wonder about where I am. I am in Providence, Rhode Island, but I chose this background, uh, the island of San Giorgio, because you'll see it in some ways will come into my, my, uh, my presentation. So here we go, I'm gonna share my screen and uh, I am going to uh, start my PowerPoint. Let's see, and I hope, uh, please give me, uh, is my volume low or can you it, hear me? It's fine, I think. It's fine for everybody? Yes. Okay, great. I'll, I'll have to lower the volume at some point, but um, okay. So here we go. Uh, there is no doubt uh, that uh, the pandemic uh, brought about a perhaps irreversible acceleration uh, in the already sustained pace of uh, virtualization of our social life. 
uh, besides being all uh, you know confined in this strange uh, trans space, uh, you know their shared uh, multi-walled, multi-eyed uh, Zoom room, as, as uh, Henry Jenkins showed us yesterday. Uh, this virtualization has had an enormous impact on global mobility uh, as well. The virtual travel industry, uh, uh, you know, emerged over the past uh, 10, 15 years, uh, seems to have taken advantage of this opportunity. What was mostly conceived as a marketing tool um, uh, for real travel, uh, you know, has become the end product, uh, among other things. And likewise, more than 60% of museums worldwide have increased substantially their online presence using social media, online tours, or virtual exhibitions, uh, and the likes. Glorious cult uh, cultural institutions such as the Uffizi have embraced social media campaigns as part of a successful strategy of survival with some positive resonance, as this New York Times article from last year uh, shows. So the Uffizi TikTok campaign uh, is part of a broader virtualization strategy uh, deployed by the museum, as shown by this video produced by the startup uh, a virtual Italy. I'll start it, but I will also mute it if I can find a way to mute it because I don't want to affect. I want to, I'm going to talk over it. All right? All right. Here we go. And I hope you hear my voice and not uh, uh, the background music. Can you hear my voice? So yes. this was, uh, was produced by Virtual Italy, a spin-off of a larger company, Centrica, whose stated goal is to enhance the Italian cultural and creative heritage with interactive and immersive virtual exhibitions. So cultural events with a great emotional impact in both educational and entertainment value, as they describe them. Here is another... Uh, a screenshot from their website, uh, including their motto, or you know, uh, their reality is merely an illusion, albeit a very persistent one, uh, as Albert Einstein said. So the path to virtualization is actually a two-way street. If the virtual Uffizi exhibit illustrates the most traffic direction from analog to digital, another example can illustrate the opposite trend from digital to analog. Some of you might have visited uh, the virtual Borgherini Chapel at the National Gallery in London in, 19, in, in 2017. So a perfect three-dimensional facsimile produced by the Factum Arte Foundation, based on a photogrammetric reproduction of the original, which gave visitors the illusion of being in San Pietro in Montorio in Rome. As the Guardian's uh, critic, uh, uh, Jonathan Jones wrote, and I quote, in an age when museums are criticized for their imperialist possessions and some Dubliners have even demanded the repatriation of James Joyce's bones, the miraculous transportation of a real solid yet also virtual chapel from the Janiculum to Trafalgar Square opens a radical new possibility. Now, now great art can be experienced, experienced in its place in a distant place. Uh, not only Italian art virtually transported and experienced elsewhere, but also Italian art reclaimed and restored to its original home. As an earlier project of Factum Arte shows, the wedding of Ghana, by Paolo Veronese, or better, a perfect facsimile of it, repositioned from the Louvre, where it resides, part of the Napoleonic uh, bounty of uh, Venetian art, to where it actually belonged, the refectory of the San Giorgio Maggiore complex. This project later developed into a scanning of the whole island of San Giorgio. Uh, preservation, restitution, and virtual regeneration go hand in hand in Factum Arte's large scale projects. Uh, what we are dealing with, if I can move my, yes, yeah, uh, 
However, in both the Uffizi virtual exhibit and the Factum Arte installation is a simulation of the past through digital technologies. Museum curators and specialists of virtual heritage are debating the ontological status of the museum object, as they are increasingly challenged to consider what these new kinds of artifacts, digital or digitally produced facsimiles, are communicating through their materiality or lack thereof, and what do they add or subtract to a museum experience? Is the digital reproduction of a museum object a representation, a surrogate, a facsimile, or an object in its own right, with its own peculiar materiality and aura, a presence in space and time, as Walter Benjamin defined, or... In its museum installations and exhibits, Studio Azzurro has shown the amazing possibilities opened by new ontologies. And the much missed Paolo Rosa, if you allow me to mention, in particular, has left a mark on my vision during uh, his residence at Brown uh, for a month before, the year before he, he left us. Uh, another example of the strategy embraced by Italian cultural institutions is provided by the recent opening of the Stanze Italiane at the Italian Cultural Institute of New York. Um, let's take a look at the teaser and I'll speak over it so I hope you can hear my voice. Uh, like the Uffizi TikTok videos, also this video animates animates one of the most iconic paintings of the Italian Renaissance, Veduta della Città Ideale, Opera della Francesca School, the Galleria Nazionale, Le Marche in Urbino, adding two oriental-looking merchants lifted from Masolino da Panicales, uh, San Peter healing a triple for The message is clear, uh, and so are the ingredients of this virtual Italy Absolutely. The ideal Renaissance city, New York, Venice, and Marco Polo, with an eye to China, are recombined in a statement that is also a clear marketing strategy. We Italians love beauty, and we know how to spread it, also on spreadable media, culture and business, art and science are not separated for us, etc. See Marco Polo, the connection to China, with a look, of course, of an emerging global uh, economic power, and he had a closing uh, partidio. Uh, so let's enter one of these stands. Uh, the poetic resonance is intentional in the uh, minds of the uh, of the producer. This is dedicated to Dante's seventh centenary. We access it through uh, the skyscrapers and tunnels of Fortunato de Pero's 1930 painting in New York, another futuristic vision of the global city. And we are introduced to a hypermodern Dante. see it in a moment, Gustave Doré revisited within the context of contemporary global culture, influenced by video and computer games. Perhaps more interesting is the stanza devoted to an immaterial sculpture in a given place, the Aphrodite crying by Salvatore Garao, located at another symbolic crossroads of globalization, uh, Wall Street, this in installation plays at the threshold between visibility and invisibility, embodiment and disembodiment, that interstitial and somewhat paradoxical space opened by the regeneration and simulation of our cultural heritage through digital technologies. As Garao writes, and you can see my pointer highlighting, I hope you can see that uh, corner of the window, the absence of matter for me is an act of love towards the unknown and the mystery to which almost all of humanity is committed. We are living in a time in which our physicality, our being present, 
is replaced by our virtual image and our voice, which is also impalpable. A comment that resonates also with the pandemic and post-pandemic condition. So we will come back to this dialectic of the visible and invisible, the tangible and intangible in the virtualization of cultural heritage. It has a longer history than one might suspect. Another less elaborate uh, uh, example of the virtualization of Italy on a global platform brings us back to the virtual travel paradigm. Google Arts and Culture draws a clear inspiration from the Grand Tour, regenerated, as Emiliano Ilardi and Donatella Capalbi write, and I quote, as a narrative asset oriented to a strategic rebranding of the travel in Italy through practices based on serial and transmedial formats, promoting the territories by creative production and through the construction of digital infrastructures and trans places aimed at enhancing cultural attractors. End of the long and breathless quote. So virtual travel provides both the master metaphor and the modeling concept, as well as the virtual agency for this kind of display. Google's Italian tour includes a digital gallery of Canaletto's Vedute of Venice, among the most iconic images of the Grand Tour. Often composed with the help of, the help of a camera oscura, through which Canaletto drew his scarabotti or preparatory drawings, a technique that he shares with many of his contemporaries, such as, for example, Francesco Guardi, and interpolated with 360 videos from Google Street View, the Canalettos play here the same function they did for the shans of the British aristocracy in the age of the Grand Tour. If one could not travel to Venice, one could at least conceive a visit from a good Canaletti as the Countess of Chichester writes in 1777. Interestingly, the Google simulation links an in-depth exploration of the virtual paintings to the evidence of climate change and rising sea levels that we can find in them, a secret science embedded in the paintings, to use David Hockney's expression, uh, when they are translated into a form of data visualization. Art and data science culture and business, again, remixed in a clever presentation. In Canaletto's times, the 900-year-old Serenissima, a semi-global city, once terminus of the Silk Road to the Katai, has already turned from a commercial power into a capital of the entertainment industry, a spectacle to be viewed rather than a place to be discovered, as Rosemary Sweet rights in the uh, cities of the Grand Tour. A century later, the Venetian Cosmorama, celebrated by Giorgio Poulet in 1844, has been reduced to a battered peep show and a bazaar, as Henry James lamented back in 1909. Venice has been painted and described and photographed, we may add, many thousands of times. And of all the cities of the world, is the easiest to visit without going there, James also wrote. The Grand Tour paradigm has survived uh, throughout the 19th and 20th century. It dates back at least to Sansovino's uh, 1561 guidebook, Venetia Città Nobilissima et Singolare the most noble and singular city in the double meaning of the word and a unique and peculiar. Grand Tour Italiano is the title of this recent collection of rare early 20th century footage made available by the Cineteca of Bologna, including these amazing color images of Venice in 1912. So let's switch to my project, Italian Shadows. Um, it describes this process of virtualization exploiting the possibilities offered by digital simulation for a better understanding of some of the artifacts of the Grand Tour age, and in particular, how virtual travel was part of it since the beginning. It includes six case studies, 
or epistemological tales, as I call them, focused on analog optical devices, such as the Mondo Nuovo or Cosmorama, the Camera Obscura as both a reproduction and projecting device, the Polemoscope, the Magic Lantern with its phantasmagoric variety, the Moving Panorama, and the Stereoscope. These devices belong to a peculiar dimension of pre-digital popular culture in which experimental optics, technology, and artistic practices converged or intersected to produce hybrid immersive experiences, forms of virtual travel and social wireism that conceptually foreshadow those afforded today by our sophisticated digital apparatuses and social media. Simulation is the key term, as you may have guessed by now. So let's take the Mondo Nuovo or Cosmorama, also known as a uh, pantoscope or more popularly a peep show box. The Mondo Nuovo was an ornate box with small portal through which the viewer could enjoy distances and perspectives. Here are a few images of the Mondo Nuovo in the background of two vignettes of Venetian life painted by Pietro Longhi. We often see these works uh, uh, multiplied by the inventors in the piazza, wrote Carlo Goldoni in a poem entitled Il Mondo Nuovo. And especially during carnival time, people come running around them and go crazy to see them. No image better illustrates these verses than this painting by Gian Domenico Tiepolo, the son of Gian Battista Tiepolo, the greatest illusionist of the Rococo age. Both Tiepolo's father and son are mixed in with the crowd. Here is uh, Gian Domenico looking through a monocle over the shoulders of his famous father as to emphasize the playful optical nature of the composition as an illustration of what in my monograph I call social wireism. Here is the interactive simulation of the Mondo Nuovo device uh, we have created uh, for my digital book. As you can see, our model is based on the iconography and is meant to demonstrate how the device worked. For a coin, a tourist could admire Venice from afar and then switching the view, sail to the city on the river Brenta, on the ferry called the Burchello, as this view uh, d'optique by Canaletto shows. Venetians, on the other hand, could enjoy a virtual version of their own city, including special effects that make the virtual view even more magical than the actual place. How was it done? The prints, such as this Canaletto view of the Arsenale, the famous Venetian uh, shipyard, were artfully perforated and colored pieces of cloth glued to the back. When aptly illuminated by natural light or by candle, uh, candles positioned inside the Mondo Nuovo, they produced the wondrous day to night effect. The digital slideshow is part of the exhibit of the Museum of Cinema in Turin, and you might have seen it there. Canaletto and his vedute uh, were a major agent of virtual travel. Already in the 18th century, view the tick uh, based on Canaletto's drawings and paintings, disseminated all over Europe uh, through the Remondini, Tesini, and Savoyardi colporteur networks, made virtual travel a fundamental dimension of the uh, Grand Tour. However, in my project, digital modeling and simulation are not simply tools used to illustrate the way devices such as the Mondo Nuovo worked. The design of the digital monograph was actually inspired by this device, a magnificent example of Venetian Cosmorama or Mondo Nuovo, shaped as a teatro all'italiana. I shot this short video at the Museum of the Cinema in Padua, which, uh, sorry, which houses the Zotti Minici collection. Uh, you see how we work, you know, you looked uh, through one of these uh, portals, they looked uh, and uh, uh, illuminated inside was a print, and you had the impression of looking into a three-dimensional space, looking in the distance. Uh, so it was a perspectival machine with uh, special effects incorporated. A digital rendering of this device provides 
the modeling concept for the digital monograph as a 2D simulation of a 3D artifact. Translated into an animation, the jacket paratext on landing page of the digital book, it suggests that all the digital simulations of the devices contain each other and are all ideally contained within the Mundo Nuovo model as an optical theater. More importantly, it suggests that simulation is the feedback loop between analog devices and their digital models, as I try to show in my epistemological tales. For example, Canaletto's use of the camera obscura cannot be simply reduced, as the caption included in the Google Gallery I showed you before does, to a realistic or hyper-realistic effect, a precursor of photographic and even cinematic imaging. As another simulation shows, things are slightly more complicated, and I would say more suggestive. With the construction, I'm sorry, let me go back to the print before because uh, I would like to show you, if I may, let me pause this. Uh, with the construction of ephemeral shacks and stalls called Casotti, the Piazzetta of San Marco, where the Savoyardi show the Mondo Nuovo, would from time to time play host to a variety of exotic attractions and performances. We have created a model and a simulation of one of such Casotti, uh, a sort of working Mondo Nuovo designed by Domenico Selva, a famous uh, Venetian lens maker in 1757. Our model is based on the description, no image is available, provided by his son Lorenzo Selva, professor of optics at the University of Padua, in one of his treatises entitled Six Philosophical Optical Dialogues, published in 1787. Here, based on the description, is this digital model that we produced. In the middle of the casotto, the description goes, there was a large basin on the floor enclosed by a balustrade. An optical apparatus positioned on the roof, turning slowly, projected on the floor the animated images of the world outside. So our interactive simulation is not just a demo. It is also built upon a theory that the walk-in camera obscura designed by Domenico Selva and described by Lorenzo son is indebted to Francesco Algarotti's praise of the camera obscura as both a tool that enables painters to see reality as though painted by the hand of nature and used in order to produce you know, copies of reality or images, perspective uh, representations of reality and also as a simulation of human vision, the interior of our eye, as Algarotti writes in his bestseller book, Newtonianism for the Ladies, with an implicit reference to Kepler's theory of retinal images, imaging. Nature is continually forming such pictures in our eye, writes Algarotti. Camera obscura, he adds, tongue in cheek is not the worst place in the world to entertain a lady. So in Lorenzo uh, Selva's description hanging on the walls of the Casotto, there were what he describes as three animated paintings arranged to compose a 360 degree panoramic view from the Piazzetta, the actual view one could enjoy from within the Casotto if it had windows. On your left, the Doge Palace, the Riva degli Schiavoni, the Basin and San Giorgio Maggiore, in the center, La Salute and the mouth of the Grand Canal, and on the right, uh, San Marco uh, with the Campanile and the Torre dell'Orologio in the distance. Here is the thought experiment we introduced in our simulation uh, as a sort of an interpretative tool. What if the animated paintings described by Selva were actual views by Canaletto? perhaps painted with the help of the camera obscura. The paintings we selected to illustrate uh, this idea not only correspond in detail uh, to the descriptions provided by Selva, but have an interesting history. 
They are part of a collection sold by the British consul in Venice, Joseph Smith, to King George III, and they were probably intended to be incorporated symmetrically into the decoration of a Venetian room at Windsor Castle. Entering the room, George III or royal visitors thus could have the illusion of being in Venice. In short, this room could be conceived as a replica of the Selvas Casotto on the Piazzetta. Within the Selvas Camera Obscura, a perfect copy and a virtual projection of reality, both pictura and imago, to use Kepler's uh, terminology, simultaneously materialize. To emphasize this point in our simulation, we have also added a few images virtually projected on the floor of the Casotto model. I don't know if you see the silhouette of the painter there, and so we introduce this uh, kind of uh, clumsy uh, representation you know, uh, of, of the painter to emphasize the fact that uh, camera obscuras were actually uh, also uh, tools used by painters such as Canaletto. One uh, of the paintings that we introduced in the simulation is the strange view of the piazza from the piazzetta with the campanile and the south side of San Marco, 1744. If you look closely, you'll notice that this image only makes realistic sense if we look at it through a mirror or an elaborate projection device, such as the one contained in the, in the Casotto city. So you see here the painting, uh, but uh, of course uh, uh, this mirrored in the device in the Casotto, you can see that San Marco is on the left where it should be, here is the Campanile and here is the Piazzetta. So uh, it was painted by Canaletto intentionally as a sort of a trompe l'oeil uh, and uh, for uh, showing the experimental nature of uh, Canaletto's painting, not just its uh, realistic uh, uh, goals. So as a forerunner, of an immersive uh, VR installation, the Selvas walk-in walk Mondo Nuovo also worked as a candy camera. From inside the Casotto, one could spy unseen on the people outside using the same mirroring uh, refracting mechanism. Thus, we intentionally included in the simulation another example of animated paintings. It comes from a collection of 400 scientific instruments and optical games multiplying and distorting mirrors, prisms, a camera obscura, a solar microscope, and at least two magic lanterns, originally used by Giovanni Polleni to teach and entertain his students in his theater of experimental philosophy at the University of Padua, the first such didactic laboratory of any Italian university, now at the Padua University Museum of Physics, also online, a virtual gallery. Among these artifacts, some provided to Polini by Domenico Selva himself, a magic lantern, and you see one here on the right, and this glass slide, which attracted my attention because it shows a Venetian casotto on the piazzetta, with the Barker portrayed in the act of inviting inside a small crowd of characters in Venetian costumes to admire its, its wonders, his games. So with a little imagination, one could envision the Barker as Domenico Selva himself, inviting the characters of his son Lorenzo's dialogue to enter and enjoy the spectacle inside. So a magic lantern slide showing a miniature view of a casotto is a perfect mise en abîme of Venetian VR, and our digital simulation hopefully shows it. Another painting uh, by Canaletto we inserted in our optical theater, here is the, as you can see, the, you know, a screenshot from the simulation. Uh, insert is this view of the Grand Canal, though one can tell that it is not the Rialto Bridge we are actually looking at. Indeed, this 1757 painting commissioned to Canaletto by Francesco Algarotti belongs to the genre called Capriccio, a fantasy or invention. To be precise, a capriccio with Palladian architecture. It imagines a virtual architectural gallery on the Grand Canal, featuring some of the most famous buildings designed by Andrea Palladio, who recognized the Olympic Theater in Vicenza on the right. An 18th century twist on the pictorial representation of the ideal Renaissance city. 
Such a capriccio is yet another example of the interplay of reality and artifice, typical of a highly sophisticated visual culture, and one that nurtures its own self-virtualization, such as the Venetian, foreshadowing its contemporary surrogates. If Venice dies, as Salvatore Settis says in his book, we'll be left with the, the Venetian hotel in Las Vegas. So I hope to have shown uh, that 18th century Venetian um, artists, uh, technologists, scholars were keenly aware of the simulating hyper-realistic and virtualizing power of experimental technique. Art and science, the secret science of optics, inextricably intertwined, as Martin Kemp has shown, and uh, David Hockney has further speculated. Uh, as the famous Goldonian line goes in the Venetian Cosmorama, the theater and the world mirror each other. Um, how am I doing for time? Because I could skip this, the stereoscope and go directly to my conclusions, or you tell me uh, how, how much time I have. Uh, as, you, as you prefer, I don't know how long it's... Uh... Well, I have another 15 minutes, I would say. Yeah, yeah, I'd say so, so. If you if you want to proceed, it's fine. Okay, all right. Okay, thank you. I want to leave time for some uh, discussion, conversation. So essentially, after Canaletto, Henry James's uh, fellow Americans could travel to Venice through the stereoscope, thanks to a virtual travel system developed by the Kansas-based Underwood and Underwood Brothers. This is the last of the case studies chronologically analyzed in my monograph. Uh, in this stereograph, one of the uh, Underwood brothers shows how to use the system, complete with maps and guidebooks, a real forerunner of Google Maps. These kits were meant to provide the experience of traveling and uh, the Underwood uh, marketing strategy emphasized being there without leaving the comfort of one's own. As our simulation shows, Looking through the stereoscope, one could imagine oneself floating on a gondola at the river di Schiavoni, gazing at the Doge's palace or switching the view. One could glide under the bridge of sighs, perhaps reciting by heart Byron's immortal verses from Child, the Harold's pilgrimage. And I saw from out the way the structures rise uh, as from the stroke of an enchanter's wand. What is fascinating and added as a twist to my argument is that kits like Italy through the stereoscope could be also carried and, and used on site in order to provide a sort of AR experience, augmented reality experience, as the enhancement of an actual touristic experience, superimposing the virtual on the real, the actual place and its virtual shadow. So reaching my conclusions, what all the artifacts considered in Italian shadows have in common, in short, is this. They playfully simulated for the viewer the perception of an immersion in a three-dimensional virtual space. They also show the early and persistent fascination for a virtual shadow of reality that can be made visible through artistic and technological means. Art, art and science combine to produce a virtual experience of the place and the imagination of another place, a trans place within the same place. I hope uh, I've shown you that the history or genealogy of virtual travel as a master metaphor in the virtualization of Italy and the Italian cultural heritage is more complicated and suggestive than any reductive marketing strategy or glossy uh, you know, um, uh, video, but in the end somewhat superficial instrumental use of digital technologies can show. The ideal city, the global city, New York today, Venice in the early modern world, can provide the stage on which our entire cultural heritage can be reanimated or regenerated and reinvented, as in Canaletto's Capriccio or in Calvino's Combinatorial Magic, playing on the threshold between 
visibility and invisibility, the tangible and the intangible, embodiment and disembodiment, etc. Uh, I'd like to leave you uh, with a last example drawn from, from my monograph of the contribution that Italian artists, technologists, and improvised impresarios have given to the virtualization of the real uh, and the realization of the virtual, the two sides of the curious genealogy of virtual reality I trace in my monograph. The protagonist is one of my epistemological tales, is one of the many Italians who left their little homeland and like the Savoyardi wandered the world in search of fortune in the late 18th and early 19th century. His life also exemplified a connection between real and virtual travel, tourism and migration, adventure and colonial enterprise. In 1802, Giambattista Belzoni, the son of a Roman barber, resettled in Padua, left Italy, crossed the channel and reached London, where he took to the stage alongside other Italian expatriates, uh, such as Jack Bologna and Joseph Grimaldi, a famous clown. His debut uh, in London, on, this, uh, on the London stages, was later evoked by Charles Dickens in a note to Grimaldi's autobiography. The season is, was memorable for the appearance on the stage of the celebrated traveler, Signor Giambattista Belzoni, you see him as the Patagonian Samson, you see him here, in which character he performed prodigious, uh, prodigious feats of uh, strength, one of which was to adjust an iron frame to his body, weighing 127 pounds, on which he carried 11 persons, such as, as illustrating these images. So, uh, at six foot seven, the Patagonian Samson made quite an impression on his contemporaries. Uh, uh, so it was a sort of a, I lost my images. I lost my images here, but let me go back to them. Uh, so he represents a kind of a or statuesque uh, a representation of the noble sal salvage, you know, so it was this Roman, uh, statuary uh, uh, embodiment, uh, but at the same time as this kind, kind of orientalist uh, uh, flavor. So Belzoni's repertoire as a mountebank, known as the Grand Sultan of all conjurors, included an optical exhibition called the real Phantasmagoria, a variation on the optical spectacle, a magic lantern show with special effects practiced in those years by enigmatic and legendary figures such as Johann Georg Schoeffer, Paul Philidor, Etienne Gaspar Robert, also known as Robertson, etc. Uh, so, but the real reason why Belzoni is included in my uh, presentation is the fact that, that uh, later on, after leaving London in 1813 and wandering for a while around the Mediterranean, Belzoni and his wife, Sarah Bain Belzoni, landed in Egypt in 1815. And Belzoni, himself narrates his adventures in Egypt in a best-selling book, The Narrative of the Operations and Recent Discoveries Within the Pyramids, Temples, Tombs, and Excavation, published upon his return to London in 1820. In Egypt, the Grand Sultan of all the conjurers, who had refashioned himself as a new persona in a new attire, another orientalist attire, uh, as Barbara Spackman has described it, uh, is transform itself in, in, in a, to an agent of that variety of Orientalism known as Egyptomania. Uh, he basically uh, was also an inspiration for Spielberg's uh, Indiana Jones. Uh, and, uh, but the, the, the real reason um, why uh, I included it in, in the case study in the Italian Shadows is the following. Uh, he participated uh, in the pillaging of uh, the relics of the pharaonic culture uh, that contributed uh, to establish metropolitan museums such as the British Museum in London and the Louvre in Paris. And when, upon his return uh, to London in 1821, May 1st, 1821, he inaugurated in an Egyptian hall, the extravagant Orientalist building in Piccadilly that hosted this kind of analog uh, virtual exhibits and installation, uh, 
a perfect re a facsimile uh, reconstruction of a pharaonic tomb he had discovered two years earlier in the Valley of the King. Our, here is a print from people visiting the exhibit at the time. And uh, here is uh, a digital uh, regeneration of uh, the tomb itself in the Valley of the King, as it looks like today, done by Factum Marte. So our simulation, our model, is produced in collaboration with the Civic Archaeological Museum of Bologna, which in 2007 presented an exhibit, a physical model of the rooms of Belzoni's exhibit in scale, one to three, based on the digital scans of Belzoni's casts in, in plaster of Paris impressions taken on the spot and watercolors painted with the greatest exactness and fidelity from drawings made at the same time, a laborious task that occupied me more than 12 months, as Belzoni writes in his narrative. So the simulation, you see here a short on which I'll end, also includes this model of two rooms, but our goal in building this model and creating this interactive digital rendering of the Belzoni exhibit was slightly different. I wanted to provide the readers, users of Italian Shadows with a model reflecting the concept of the exhibit and its reception among contemporaries. As the New Monthly Magazine reported at the time, not only the remains of ancient Egypt were presented to the eye in models which contain, to a fraction, the forms and hue of the originals. But two of the imitated chambers of the tomb are of their exact size, so that to the eye, and in no partial degree, to fancy's eye, you sit in them as in the realities themselves, and are in the presence of objects that fill the mind with pleasing wonder, conscious as it is at the time of its own transient existence in its rapid wasting tenement, the body. So scholars have suggested that Belzoni's show, considered by some a founding episode in the commodification of Egyptomania, is the source of a tendency to represent Egypt not just as an exhibition, but as though it were an exhibition, as Sophie Thomas writes. So an extravagant and thrilling simulacrum, a presentation of the artifacts on display, not as art, but as real, a simulation, in other words, an analog situation, simulation, with perfect replicas of an Egyptian tomb walls and ceilings and original relics displayed on an upper gallery, Belzoni's exhibit managed to reanimate Pharaoh uh, Seti's final resting place for the consumption of its visitors, arguably an immersive imaginative experience similar to uh, those that uh, we uh, have up nowadays with, in museum and VR experience and so, and so forth. So to conclude, uh, this is interesting, not only because Belzoni is somehow a precursor of uh, in, in an analog dimension of, uh, of uh, uh, virtual uh, installations uh, that uh, are common nowadays and done performed with digital, uh, digital uh, uh, means, but also because uh, uh, the scope and the goal of our simulation was really to focus on the reception of contemporaries. And uh, you see here in one of the, you've seen uh, a glance at the shadows of two of those uh, visitors. Uh, the whole experience of our simulation is based on the uh, descriptions that we find in contemporary texts uh, of people who visited the actual, the actual. Uh, so the, our model has no pretense to reproduce the realistic effect of the exhibit, but rather to capture its aura as an exhibit. I'll end here because I don't want to take more time. I've taken already more time than I thought I would. Uh, so I'll stop sharing my but I hope I gave you uh, a sense of uh, both the scope of the project 
the role that the simulation have in this project and the whole idea, the theoretical framework, if you want, of the modeling concept of simulation as an alternative to other forms, uh, more opportunistic forms, I would say, of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, um, uh, sort of exploiting the feedback loop between analog and digital, etc. And here, if there are questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you, thank you very much for for this very fascinating lecture and and for research and, and for sharing these incredible videos and simulation. And um, I I would like to open the floor to questions, and you can either uh, write them in the chat or uh, you can unmute yourself and and talk directly to to Professor Riva. Uh, um I don't I don't see anyone in the chat for now, I think. If nobody has any question right now, I have one. Uh oh, but I see a hand. Sorry. So I Paolo, I think. Uh yeah, uh well, thank you so much for, for this presentation. It was really uh, incredible to see all the options that the digital um, gives us. Um, a question I have, I, I realize this um, this project has very much to do with, uh, you know, uh, with seeing and, and other people uh, seeing and, you know, with seeing in general. But I was uh, wondering whether there is also some auditory uh, aspect to it some uh you know some sonic quality to to the simulations or if you're uh thinking also in terms of sound yes no this is an excellent question in fact uh, you know sound uh, of course uh, any attempt to uh, to create a, a an environmental <laughs> uh you know a simulation uh, sound even in the video you i've shown you of uh, the ideal city the uh, there is this uh, background music uh, or you know futuristic music in other i we i decided no to to not to include uh, uh, sound and music uh, um, uh, I could have, uh, you know, included the sounds from Venetian, uh, uh, you know, artificial into it, but it would be it would have been uh, uh, for two reasons. One, because it would have been quite artificial, you know, uh, you know, in a sense. Uh, uh, and uh, I know there is a fascinating research about uh, soundscapes, and uh, and and uh, that would be certainly something I would be happy to. Introduce and in order to integrate the uh, you know oculocentric <laughs> dimension of my of my uh, monograph, but but of course I couldn't do everything and also introduce in sound, introduce other technical problems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, no, I wanted to focus on the visual experience because really, like Jonathan Clary and many other have, have, have shown, is really what uh, as a sort of a guided and uh, and uh, and to some extent hegemonized uh, you know a certain uh, the virtualization process in the uh, in modern times you know it, it, all these um, optical tools were meant to to uh, you know to were focused on on vision and perception and, uh, and so that's clearly why I, I sort of uh, uh, extracted them from the from the environment to some extent. I mean, of course, looking into the Mondo Nuovo, you might have heard that the the, the Barker giving instructions, what are you looking at, describing, or you could have heard the street noises in Venice, etc., uh, uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Many, many, there is a component, perhaps even music, there some of them had actually, you know, the panorama certainly had musical accompaniment, but panorama is another chapter in my uh, dissertation. Um, dissertation. I wish it was a dissertation. This is an interesting lapsus because we were talking about before digital monographs. And, you know, uh, no, in my monograph. So, so yes, it's a deliberate choice to focus on the visual, uh, and uh, and the, much of the story has to do with the the evolution of this artificial eye, as uh, as uh, Algarotti calls it, uh, Algarotti in the eighteenth century. 
sorry. I just wanna, I, I see Manuela is a question. I'm gonna just interject very quickly. I would like to ask him if you had the chance to reflect on how the experience of simulation has changed from a time when simulation meant that you were a viewer and, and now in which Simulation means most of the time that you are an actor and you are you are interacting with with other people in these. So it's quite a, it's still simulation, but it's a very different experience. No, absolutely. But in a sense, uh, some sort of agency was part of this uh, simulation. I mean, uh, it's interesting. There was not just passive. You know, the idea of simulation uh, that uh, uh, although the the visual experience clearly has some sort of a passive uh, dimension. You know, you look at something, but there is an active. If uh, you know, when the the, the quote I. I uh, read from the, uh, you know, about the Belzoni exhibit, this, the fence's eye. So when we talk about the artificial eye, it's a complex act of vision. And there is this something, there is the perception, this is part of the argument I try to make in my, this, in my monograph, that, uh, you know, there is this sort of imaginative process in uh, uh, that these um, visual tools uh, really uh, trigger, you know, uh, so in which you start imaginating and elsewhere. So you're not just a passive receptor of, uh, of but you're sort of activated as a viewer. This is also what Jonathan Clary writes in his studies, etc. So uh, the, there is already the seed of uh, what simulation have become <laughs> thanks to our digital tools in which we we become players in other words so, you know we can play but it meant that you were alone in this simulation it was just you and the, the simulated world and instead now you, you yes that's, yes and no yeah. in a sense uh, you know I, the, the the mondo nuovo by tiepolo which is my first chapter an analysis of the painting as an optical tool, <laughs> shows that this was never completely done in isolation. And this was part of a social scene, you know. So it was part of the carnival scene in in, uh, in Venice. If there is a simu, you know, a simulating stage or a stage of simulation at various level, a social simulation was certainly the the carnival stage. So yes, it's true that when you looked inside the monorama, you isolated yourself, or the stereoscope, you isolated yourself from the environment. Uh, but at the same time, this was part of a social fabric of a social. Uh, so I tried to make that argument uh, in in my book, and I hope uh, you know you'll, you'll find it <laughs> when you read the book <laughs> convincing. <laughs> yeah. Manuela, I see that. As, uh, thank you. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Massimo. It was really rich and stimulating. I I, I particularly appreciated uh, well. Clearly, the historical and comparative uh, reconstruction of concepts like simulation, uh, virtuality, and augmented reality. Before you started talking about the, the experience of augmented reality, in fact, I was writing my question because I was, uh, I was wondering, uh, I mean, this comparative approach between uh, concepts that seem to be just part of our contemporary life, but where, in fact, as you demonstrated, part, part of cultural history from for for a long, long time, show also how we used the need of, for simulation we had. Why did we need to simulate uh, landscapes? Or So it, that was very clear and I extremely fascinating in the way it showed that you know, virtual tourism in fact existed already. And I was wondering um, what, uh, what was the purpose of augmenting the reality you were living when you were there. I mean, now for in that sense, the comparison um, is, um, yes, is, is interesting, it's stimulating because I was wondering, now we usually project information buildings, you know, this is how augmented reality, or we project a different kind of, uh, uh, well, an historical reconstruction of a building. Do you, well, I was just wondering whether you could say a little bit more about the experience of augmented reality through the stereoscope. No, stereoscope. Yeah. yeah, no, it's fascinating. It's not just a stereoscope. You know, why would uh, Domenico Selva, this uh, illustrious uh, lens maker, you know, optician, public optician, build a, a device, an optical device, for people to look uh, at the reflection of uh, 
what was outside. <laughs> and that was such a, an experience, you know, not, you know, it's like for us, uh, you know, donning, at least uh, uh, some of us donning the headsets, you know, a very Oculus Rift or whatever, and, uh, and uh, looking at uh, perhaps the same things that we, <laughs> we, we would be looking with our own eyes and why that augment. So it's for the stethoscope, it's a little complex because um, one thing I try to show throughout the, the, the book is digital monograph is that uh, this this device has worked as travel substitute. So in other words, as a, you know, as a way of traveling virtually without uh, moving from you. But at the same time, they also enhanced the whole uh, idea of traveling and and being there. So being there, so in in a way that builds a virtual dimension into our real experience. So this is the point, and I think this is the fascination. Why is this? A, you know, uh, you know, for me, for it's an interesting way of looking at a nineteenth century culture, for instance. Because we consider a realism and representation of realism up until late 19th century as the paradigm uh, through which we can understand, uh, you know. Uh, but it was never that simple. It was never like that. The virtual dimension is really very much part in a critical, imaginative, playful, technological <laughs> way, etc. So I think that's that's really what I was interested in. So for people, you know, fascinating, it's like seeing the same thing why we look into our phone. Hey, we map, you know, we look at the map, even though we could just look at the name of the street and go around the corner and find our way in our destination. But we follow the GPS and then, of course, we get the GPS and we get lost uh, inevitably, et cetera, et cetera. So you see this, this kind of an interesting interaction uh, that, you know, this fascination for uh, a, a reflection of reality that, uh, you know, enhances our idea of reality at the same time, you know, allows us to enter a new dimension, you know. So I think that was part of the fascination of the stereoscope. And also to see whether the real thing looked exactly like the photograph or the, you know, so it was a way of, uh, of uh, you know, so there are many possibilities there. <laughs> Sorry, just just one comment. I was wondering whether they also maybe distort or uh, manipulated reality. You know, that it could be considered as a sort of uh, uh, anticipation of you know, kind of um, uh, different type of representation, not mimetic, but uh, trying to uh, abstract or um, provide more of an impressionist. I mean, that leads to many. Many yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's true. The cinema is, has the same impact to some extent, you know, the, the realistic, but also imaginative, uh, etc. You know, uh, for people, it, it's interesting with the stereoscope, uh, uh, the, the, you know, finding your, you know, the maps at the position from where the photographs were taken. So you could uh, uh, look at the map and look. So it was a kind of a multimodal uh experience reading experience that uh, in fact i compare my own monograph to uh, uh, one of those stereoscopic kits because reading a monograph is like finding your place in the, on the map and the looking at uh, you know the real thing the object but looking it through some lenses etc so uh, it's it's interesting it's a, a complex cognitive perceptual uh cognitive um, you know uh, uh, imaginative uh, act that uh, is there. Uh, and uh, I think it shifts, the meaning shifts with our digital tools. And, uh, you know, we are more interested in the virtual than the real. Uh, the stereoscope is a point where there is still a balance between our, you know, fascination for the real, but already big things begin to shift towards, you know, uh, how more interesting and uh, uh, and uh, to some extent enjoyable is to uh, to look at the virtual uh, reproductions, <laughs> the, you know, and then then the real thing, you know, and so on. Yeah. Yeah, I think we should get like Cloda has a question, and then we are leaning toward the end. Cloda. 
I'm always muted. <laughs> Sorry. Massimo, this is just a curiosity. I actually, some years ago, when I went and talked to Studio Azzurro, I asked them this question about Oculus Rift, virtual reality in that kind of form. And, and I think they were slightly horrified. We were sitting around, a, around, around their table um, in their studio and they just kind of said, it's just, it's too individualistic. It's too, you know, although it's interactive, it's too individualistic and we just don't want to get involved with it. And I was tempted to, to ask, you know, uh, ask him again whether he's changed his view. I, I wondered about you when you're, you're working in these kind of environments, are you tempted to take that step and create things within, within a virtual um, environment? Well, I mean, as I was saying before in our conversation uh, before the lecture, um, these, this um, uh, simulation were produced on an Unity uh, platform, you know, Unity software, which is used in computer games, uh, you know, usually, etc. Uh, precisely because I wanted to also to to have the the option of maybe create some installation base that may be using them in my classroom or uh, etc but the question about the isolation you know social isolation and social wireism as i call it uh, you know this collective uh, uh thing we are all engaged in to some extent uh, uh is is one of the most important one i i, I tackle in, you know in this in this and i know where the studio azzurro comes from because i, I had I, you know Many conversation with Paolo, and particular Paolo Rosa, uh, but 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 you know, and in fact, how for them the the you know the digital was always part of a, uh, to be embedded into an analog experience to some extent, even uh, uh, enriching you know the, the think and the collective experience. Think about uh, all their museums uh, design, but also uh, I think about the. The, the exhibit for the 150th anniversary at the uh, you know in Turin uh, etc this you know part fascinating it's in. so I was trying to do a little bit of the same <laughs> for the reader or <laughs> user you reader of my so although but unfortunately the limitations are those you know when you read a book you're alone uh, when you teach in a class you can actually sort of open up to that kind of a uh, you know, um, social dimension of, uh, you know, of looking at things together, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, being in a movie theater together, being in an installation together. And uh, that's why I focused very much on the reception of this, uh, of Belzoni's installation, etc. I was, I wanted really not to, to superimpose our 21st century view on, on the, but to understand what the contemporaries really uh, how they looked at it, and uh, and so that particularly, I would say that Belzoni's chapter deal with this uh, with this thing because with this uh, question that you you pose, because really it was to some extent visiting the, the Egyptian tomb or the facsimile <laughs> was a collective experience, and uh, you know people reacted in a different way, and uh, and it was very interesting to see what their reactions were, etc were kind of a shared uh, virtual uh, experience. <laughs> which, is, which is what we miss so much, I think, um, under COVID, is that kind of shared experience. Um, I know we've got Corinna here um, at the moment, and when I was talking to Corinna about teaching, um, she said that these tiles that we see in front of us that might have faces on them reminds her of a, of a graveyard, um, of a, it's an Italian graveyard with the, the kind of the faces which have been kind of fossilized in some, some sort of way. And it's a peculiar mixture between the individual um, and, and, and the collective, really, um, this experience that we're going through. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, they're, I think they're going to be um, uh, themes that we'll pick up over the next few years as well. Um, there's lots more I could ask you, but I'm not, I'm not going to take too much more. Time. <laughs> the next time. When finally the, the monograph comes out, <laughs> you'll see there is much more in there actually. Okay. Yeah, I think that if if there aren't any any more question, perhaps we could we could thank Massimo for for being with us, and I would also like to thank you all the participants to the second interdisciplinary Italy Summer School. 
And also I would like to thank you, Martina Mendola, who took care of the technical side of this lecture today and the one yesterday. And yes, let's hope that we can do it another time soon, maybe in presence without the tiles. <laughs> <laughs> and with drinks afterwards. <laughs> Absolutely.